I was reading the other day that the true story of the Apollo 13 moon mission has finally come to light. A 97-year-old press secretary from NASA has finally broken his silence, of course, now long retired. It was 40 years ago, and on day three of the mission, an oxygen tank exploded, which left them without power and a damaged main antenna and with minimal fuel. Now, you might have seen the movie, or of course, if you're old enough, you might remember it very vividly. And the rescue strategy was incredible because the NASA scientists couldn't figure out what to do, whether there was going to be enough fuel to decelerate the ship and turn around and head for home or not. Now, in the end, they did something radically different. And here is where the true story has finally come to light. See, NASA had the radically ingenious idea to keep heading the way they were and then to slingshot around the moon to use the momentum from the orbit around the moon so they only needed one little squirt of the remaining fuel at exactly the right time to head them safely back for home. Now, the true story that came out this week is this, that the ingenious idea didn't come from NASA at all, but a phone call from a graduate student at MIT. He'd done the maths, he'd figured it out, And he rang them up at just the right time with the solution. He said, how about you try this? And they did. Now, here's the scandal. And here's why we haven't heard about this until just last week. Because, you see, when Apollo 13 landed safely home, NASA contacted the student and they were going to introduce him to the president and the media with great honour. Until they found out that he was a hippie type with long hair. And they decided that because of that, he wouldn't be suitable to honour in front of the nation. Uh, The guy's hairdo was a scandal. Now, of course, times have changed. And now just this week, if you've been watching the media, everyone's talking about the Mohawk guy in the control room of the Mars mission. who's got a distinctive hairstyle all of his own. And these days, the President of the United States is cracking jokes about it. My point being, as we come to a chapter in Corinthians that on one level looks like it's all about hairstyles, it's not quite as remote as it seems. That a passage that's all about what you do with your head covering, that what you do with your hair, and what it says to other people is in one sense still relevant today, except maybe in some slightly different ways. And even over the last 30 years, things like this have radically changed in their meaning. My dad would always wear a hat and remove it in the presence of a lady. A generation ago, it was shocking for a lady not to wear a hat to church or a formal occasion, or still shocking not to wear a hat to the races, of course. At William and Kate's wedding last year, there was huge interest in the hats especially the one worn by Princess Beatrice. And then scandal that the Prime Minister's wife didn't wear a hat at all to the royal wedding, which was labelled in one newspaper as treasonous. Again, the point being, in certain cultures, in certain times, head-covering customs really do mean something, even in ours, even today. And back in the 60s, I guess in a way that the NASA guys even had a point because the hippie student guy who came up with the idea that saved the space mission, the reason he was wearing his hair long, as best I recall hippie hairstyles, the sole reason for it was just to thumb his nose at the establishment. That's what it was for, as a mark of rebellion. In the context of 1972 America, he's actually saying something by what he's doing with his hair. Which brings us at long last to our passage, which at first reading does seem, at least in the first half of the chapter, to you all about head coverings, uh, men who do when they shouldn't, women who don't when they should. But it's actually, in the end, more about what they are saying by what they're doing. And this morning, we're not just looking at the head covering question, we're looking at the rest of the chapter as well, which raises the same question of what the Corinthians are saying by what they're doing, in this case with the Lord's Supper. 
And in both cases, though it sounds like he's talking about very ancient customs, the issues Paul's addressing here are very real and very, very relevant. In 1 Corinthians 11, we're invited to a public meeting of the Corinthian church. Paul changes his focus, in a sense, from the problems in the church family, which we've seen in chapters 1 to 10, to the problems in their church meetings. And the two are actually closely related. There are people praying in the church. There are people prophesying in the church. There are people sharing in the Lord's Supper together. And all of it in Corinth they are doing wrong because in all of it they are serving themselves instead of taking a cross-shaped attitude of serving one another. Now remember what Paul has just said at the end of chapter 10, the start of chapter 11. Remember we saw last week he said, I try to please everyone in every way, for I am not seeking my own good, but the good of many, so they may be saved. He says, follow my example as I follow the example of Christ. And yet if you take a look at the shape of this chapter, you'll see it's all about praying and prophesying from verse 2 to 16 and sharing the Lord's Supper in verses 17 to 34. And in both cases, the Corinthians are just in it for themselves. In it for number one. In both cases, the Corinthians are forgetting what it means to follow the cross-shaped example of the Apostle Paul who follows the cross-shaped example of Jesus Christ. Others first. Now, you've got to ask... What could possibly go wrong with a bunch of people getting together and praying? You'll notice he's talking about prophecy as well in the chapter, which raises a whole bunch of questions we'll come back to in chapter 14. Uh, But prayer, it actually sounds pretty safe, doesn't it? Well, apparently not. Now, can I ask you as we come to read verse 3, if it startles your 21st century logic to hold your fire, Because it is a verse about headship, you'll notice. Husbands as the head of their wives. And it's an idea that's been abused, I know, by generations of men who have totally misread and misunderstood what verses like this are saying. And especially the first part, because we've so often misunderstood what you make of the headship of Christ which drives the logic of the whole verse. See, we've seen over and over again in Corinthians, uh, we've seen it just a few verses ago, that Christ's headship is all about his care for us, even to the point of going to the cross. A headship that's all about pouring himself out for the sake of his people. And as we look at verse 3, keep in mind that Paul's going to say, I want men to be men and do that same thing for their women. The Lord Jesus didn't say, bring me my pipe and my slippers while I watch TV. The Lord Jesus said, I give up my life for you. Now I want you to realise, says Paul in verse 3, now I want you to realise that the head of every man is Christ and the head of the woman is man and the head of Christ is God. I want you to realise that and I want you to model it, he says, in every way you can and especially when you meet in church and especially when you pray and prophesy, do public things at the front of the church. And especially in this case, he goes on to say, in whether or not you cover your heads with a veil. Husbands, no, he says. Wives, yes. Now, there is all sorts of historical research into what's going on culturally with this stuff back in Greco-Roman culture. Now, there are some suggestions that here in the context of the church that it's to do with Jewish customs because a lot of the Corinthian Christians have come over from the synagogue with Jewish backgrounds where the male synagogue leader always covers his head to pray. As Jewish men still do with the skull cap and have done for generations since the mameluke or the kippah they call it. The ancient Talmud says this, cover your head in order that the fear of heaven may be upon you. A one famous rabbi said he never walked more than two metres with his head uncovered because he said the divine presence is always over my head. He's protecting himself from it. To which Paul says, no, those days are over. 
He says, you're not Jewish anymore because now in Christ you are the image and glory of God. Now in Christ, he says, a man doesn't stand before God covered but confident. Now just briefly have a look at a similar idea from Paul in his second letter to Corinth, the, uh, the verse on the screen behind me. 2 Corinthians 3.18, Paul says this, Now we, with unveiled faces, all reflect the Lord's glory and are being transformed into his likeness with ever-increasing glory, which comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. Now we, who with unveiled faces, reflect the Lord's glory. Now, of course, in Greek culture, there were head-covering customs as well. Wives especially wore a head-covering to show they were married, which for us is carried across in a token way in the wedding veil on the wedding day. In ancient culture, it stayed on whenever you were in public. Now, you can research that in detail later if you like. I can point you to some good resources. But but amidst all the details, amid all, all the cultural history, the thing that is very clear is that in Corinth, they are determined to rock the boat. Both the men and the women are for some reason making a point by the way they're wearing their hair or covering their heads. And it seems that the men were missing the point and the women were making a point. And so the women, he says, who are uncovering their heads are dishonouring their heads, their husbands. Because their beauty, he says, their glory is for their husband at home. Now, there is a cultural symbolism that they need to respect. And oddly, it's exactly different for the men and the women. So verse 4, every man who prays or prophesies with his head covered dishonours his head, the Lord Jesus... And every woman who prays or prophesies with her head uncovered dishonours her head, her husband. Now again, we mightn't quite understand all the symbolism, but one thing you can say for sure is that they did. The Corinthians knew exactly what they were doing. And for the women especially, it seems, it's a declaration of independence at the wrong time, in the wrong place, in the wrong way. When in verse 11, if you look at that, it uh, says that Christian marriages in a unique way are meant to be about interdependence. And so verse 11, in the Lord, however, for us Christians, woman is not independent of man, nor is man independent of woman. For as woman came from man, so also man is born of woman. Now, now do you see that verse? Because... It is the one thing that I guess is clear across all cultures that that makes some kind of sense too of what they're doing culturally. Paul says you are not independent, so stop acting like you are. The women, as they prophesy and pray in their church meeting, which was radical enough in itself, in the synagogues they would have been separated completely. But now they're using it as a power play. They're making a first century feminist statement of independence. And so they unveil, they take off the symbol that they're under the caring headship of their husband and they make a public stand for their rights. Forgetting, of course, the Lord Jesus who put aside his rights at the cross. Now, of course, these days, if you're a married woman, you won't assert your independence over your husband by taking off your headscarf. But there are other ways, aren't there, of doing the same. We've got powerful symbols in our own culture. Like a little wedding ring, you slip it off to go to a party or the pub. What's it saying? It is a huge declaration of independence, isn't it? Or the word symbols that we have. Taking your husband's surname. Insisting you call yourself Ms. So it's indeterminate whether you're actually married or not. Blurring the lines. Always of a wife saying, I am independent of you instead of one with you. And Paul's saying, whatever you might think about this stuff, when you meet for church, show your dependence and do not be contentious about it. Verse 16, if anyone wants to be contentious about this, we have no other practice, nor do the churches of God. Who'd have thought that they could use prayer time at church to be contentious or for point scoring? But the Corinthians, of course, did it as if it came easily. 
Now, there is another thing they're getting wrong in church as well. Verse 17, in the following directives, I have no praise for you, for your meetings do more harm than good. And again, in verse 18, it's to do with divisions. And in this case, more specifically, divisions over the Lord's Supper. Now, of course, over time, different Christian denominations have gone some very different directions over the Lord's Supper or communion, are often citing this passage as the reason. Uh, but back in Corinth, it seems very much that the Lord's Supper was a party. At least it was for some of them. Uh, back in Corinth and all around the Roman Empire, there were public feasts at the idol temples to sacrifice and give honour to the idols and to Caesar. And they would be very lavish meals. Now, it seems that the Corinthian Christians were kind of modelling their Lord's Supper on that sort of thing. A feast in honour of their Lord. But in their typical way, they're messing it up. Now, have a look, verse 20, and see how they've gone so badly wrong. He says, when you come together, it's not the Lord's Supper you eat. For as you eat, each of you literally takes for himself without waiting on anyone else. One remains hungry, another gets drunk. Now imagine this, this is like a, a kind of a nightmare MPC food for thought dinner, you know, where there's a big crowd and they're struggling to get the food around and some people are having five helpings when people up the back get none. Paul says, what kind of Lord's Supper is that? This is every man for himself in the name of the Lord Jesus. This, this is like church morning tea where you eat all K Forbes egg sandwiches before the preacher gets outside to have one. Well, I'm on a diet now anyway, so it's okay. <laughs> but see, even in the small things like sharing a meal, the Corinthians are getting it wrong. One goes ahead and grabs all the good stuff, another goes hungry. One goes thirsty, another gets drunk. And you know the common thread? Because it's all about me, me, me. My rights, my appetites, who cares about anybody else? In Corinth, Paul says it's more than that. It's actually humiliating the poor. Because apparently in their version of the Lord's Supper, it was kind of a community meal uh, where you could come and share in it. If you were hungry, if you were very, very fast. So that's good in theory, unless you end up pushed aside because you're poor. Verse 22, keep reading there. Haven't you got somewhere else you can eat? Or do you despise the church of God and humiliate those who have nothing? The ones who come hungry, missing out in the rush. And they have got the gall to call this the Lord's Supper. They've forgotten, you see, that they're even meant to be cross-shaped in their church dinners. They're even meant to be self-sacrificial at morning tea. Now, actually, to be really honest, and the reason I'm on a diet at the moment is I'm one of those foodie kinds of people who finds this quite hard. If there is only one of Kay's egg sandwiches left and you're reaching for it and I'm reaching for it, you want to watch out you don't get shoulder buttered aside. They are very good sandwiches. But you see, Paul says even in the small, small stuff, others first. They call it the Lord's Supper Paul says naming rights are revoked. It's not the Lord's Supper at all. You're kidding yourselves. Because, he says in verse 23, the Lord's Supper is meant to be a reminder of the cross, a reminder of sacrifice. And he takes them back to that annual Passover meal in the upper room the night before the crucifixion. Have a look at his description where, where Jesus says to his disciples, up till this point, the Passover you've eaten, it's, it's meant to have reminded you of the way God set the Israelites free from slavery in Egypt. But from now on, he says, do it in remembrance of me. It's radical, isn't it? Do it to remember me. For I received from the Lord, verse 23, what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread, and when he'd given thanks, he broke it and he said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me, my body given, broken for you. And then the cup after supper, verse 25, this cup is the new covenant, the new contract in my blood. 
do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. And yet at the meal, to remember the way Jesus gave everything, the Corinthians just want to take everything before anyone else. That's not the Lord's Supper. So stop and think, says Paul, stop and think before you eat and drink judgment on yourselves. Look around, he says, and recognise the body of Christ. Now now we need to think about that verse. Uh, Remember first what he said back in chapter 10, and it'll come up on the screen. Uh, Because there is one loaf, he says, we who are many are one body, for we all partake of the one loaf. Now he's about to say recognise the body that you are part of before it's too late. Stop despising the church of God and humiliating those who have nothing. Stop treating the body like that or there'll be consequences. Notice the warnings. Verse 27, Therefore, whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of sinning against the body and blood of the Lord. Now, he's not talking about having communion if you haven't been to confirmation class. He's not talking about whether or not a kid can join in or at what age. He's not even saying be introspective all week and find all your hidden sins. He's saying look around you and stop acting as if it's all about you. Because Jesus takes his church very seriously. Here it is, verse 29, and again a verse that's been used out of context in all sorts of weird ways. He says, for anyone who eats and drinks without recognising the body, eats and drinks judgement on himself. Now you see, he's not talking about looking at the bread and the wine and seeing the real flesh and blood of Jesus there, which is what the Roman Catholic Church teaches. He's saying, look around you. We who are many are one body. We are the body of Christ. These people you're with, these people you're pushing aside, these people that you are leaving hungry while you go ahead and get drunk, Jesus said, in as much as you've done it to one of these little ones of mine, you have done it to me, look around and recognise the body there. He says, you're not doing it, which is why you're experiencing God's judgement, he says. Which is why, verse 30, so many among you are weak and sick, which is why a number of you have fallen asleep dead. Now, that's astonishing, isn't it, to our ears? God is judging them for the way they treat one another, for the way they treat his church. And it comes down to pragmatics like table manners, like the way you share and make sure others are served first at a food for thought dinner or morning tea. Verse 33, such practical stuff. When you come together to eat, wait for each other. If you're really hungry, eat at home first. When you gather, put others before yourself. Now, I know that's hard. In fact, half the time you might feel you hardly know anyone here. Half the time you might feel nobody knows you, let alone cares about you. Why care for them? And yet in spite of that, the Lord Jesus is saying, this is my church. It's not your church. And somehow we've got to learn to love each other as that body. Jesus is saying, I kept on giving from my church to the very last drop of my blood. And the Corinthians, when they meet for church, they say, it's all about me. Even prayer time is a time for contention, point scoring. The Lord's Supper, they say they're remembering Jesus. Really, they're ignoring him. Couldn't be clearer. You know, someone said to me just last week, Corinthians is depressing. They said, do you really think we as a church here at MPC are just as bad as they were? What do you reckon Paul would be saying to us if he, if he wrote a letter to the Mitchelltonians or whatever we are? Do you reckon he'd be saying to us, your meetings do more harm than good? They're tough words, aren't they, back in verse 17? You might as well close down, he says. 
Have no praise for you. Your meetings do more harm than good. You know what? I, I don't want to breed complacency, but I reckon in lots of ways we actually get it. When I saw Mary here at the working bee yesterday making sure everyone else got fed, even if she had to walk home afterwards, I do hope she got a lift. Uh, the men cooking up the men's breakfast from the crack of dawn and the last to be fed themselves. And the way the Brays opened up their home to hordes of kids and parents last night. Uh, when you hear about so many unnoticed ways people step up to help out. When you see evidence of real serving, real love, real care, it all does start to add up to a much brighter picture. When you get emails from a first-time visitor at church who talks about the way she was greeted and welcomed here at MPC and got offered a lift all the way back to the city when the people actually lived the opposite direction. When we meet, I think Paul would say our meetings do more good than harm. Because I suspect we really are remembering Jesus. And Jesus, by his spirit, really is changing us. Which in the end is our only hope, whether we're sharing in the Lord's Supper or not.